is where we left off last time with this airport demo. Uh, and I put in a couple of to-dos here. Uh, the first to-do was to fix this into Radians. And I said I was going to do that offline, but I actually don't want to do that offline because I want to think about a, des a design here. Uh, first of all, I've got, uh, I've got uh, uh, you know, over here in the airport class, I've got a get air distance that, that does this stuff. Then over here, I've got this uh, get air distance that takes you know, four numbers and a, a different version that takes two airports, etc. What is it? That's distance stuff, right? Are there any other ways of measuring distance other than the spherical law of cosines on a globe? What's another way of me measuring distance? How would you measure distance between us right now? Feet? Okay, feet. But uh, if I were to do this mathematically, what would it be? Say we were two, uh, just, just points on a plane. Uh, how, how, how do you measure uh, two points in a plane? The, the distance formula being Euclidean distance, right? Uh, magnitude, magnitude would be another, you know, well, the vector magnitude or whatever uh, in three space, uh, et cetera. So it, that, but that would still be the L1 norm or whatever it is, right? So there are lots of names for this stuff. There's also the L0 norm or the Manhattan distance because you can't go through, if you want to go from, uh, in a city escape, you want to go from this point to this point, you get, can't just go through all of the buildings. You have to go down five blocks and then up three blocks. That's the Manhattan distance. There's also L2 norms, L3 norms, there's L infinite norms, right? Uh, and there's a lot of different ways of measuring distance. Do any of those things have to do uh, any, with, uh, with airports? Distance, distance, distance. Yeah, with airports you can measure distance, but they're completely separate things. So maybe I want to start out by creating another class here called distance utils. In which I will put a bunch of distance-related stuff. Right? Sound familiar? Where where would you go for a square root function? Math dot sqrt. Where would you go for a sine function? Math dot sqrt or um, sine, hopefully. Uh, S i n e or s i n. Uh, right? You would go to the math library. Now they don't call it math utils, but they certainly collect all these things together and put a bunch of all this these static functionality into a class. I'm going to do the same thing here. Uh, and to do that, I'm just going to cut, cut and paste All right. over here. Right. Now, distance utils has nothing to do with airports anymore. So should I have it like this? That doesn't sound right. right. So distance classes should deal with distance stuff. Airport classes should deal with airport stuff. Right. This is called the single responsibility principle, SRP. It's one part of solid that we'll talk about later. Uh, but uh, you know you shouldn't you shouldn't get your 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 chocolate into the peanut butter canister and you shouldn't get the uh, peanut butter canister into the chocolate. Uh, buy some Reeses if you want to do that. Right, that's a different thing. Right, uh, that that's going to be co composition. You take this canister, you take this canister, you put, mix them together, and then you've created a third object, a Reeses uh, Reeses peanut butter cup. Right, which is great and excellent, but uh, you don't you don't take these two canisters and dump them together and mix them up, that's just disgusting. Right? So stuff belongs where it, uh, in canisters in which it belongs. Right? <laughs> uh, I don't know a better way of putting that. Uh, degrees to radians, you might uh, argue, well, wait a second. That really has nothing to do with distances. So maybe we, maybe we want yet another class, uh, degree utils. <laughs> That's taking it a bit too far, right? So you've always got to know where the Goldilocks zone is. Not too cold, not too hot, just right, right? How much do you separate stuff? It's, an, it's kind of a feel, right? Now, if you don't want to advertise this to the world, you can make static methods private right? and hide the fact from the world that you do have this method called degrees to radians, and you, 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 still, you can still use it down here, right? So I, now I'm going to have to do that and take care of this to do here. Uh, double uh, lat a uh, radians is equal to uh, distance utils dot uh, degree to radians and then lat a, lat a right? And repeat one, two, three. Lat lon a radians, lat b and lon b. Right? No, why did I not go long with a g? Nice vertical alignment on everything, right? That's so pretty. 
uh, so uh, long a uh, lat b and long b, right? and then replace every instance here of lat a rad. I, I, actually, all I need to do is go rad, right? Rad, rad, rad. Cool. Rad. There we go. And rad and rad. And then L oh, there. L O N. Okay. I think that that's correct, but of course I'll need to do some proper testing here in a moment. Is there any other improvements that you can see immediately? Or all right, my to do is done. I'm done. So remember we talked about code very briefly, code reviews. This is a kind of a process where you're working in a team and you've worked on some code alone and before you track it into the repository and domain because uh, you're, you're properly using a get system, uh, then you, you go in front of your colleagues, one, at least one other colleague, two other colleagues or the rest of the team or whatever, you stand up and you explain your code. Uh, well, we've got this ticket over there and uh, the, that we needed functionality to compute uh, the spherical law of cosines distance between two latitudes and longitudes. So here's my code, right? Uh, now, is it okay to check this into uh, uh, master? Is this okay? Is it okay to, that I check this code in and make it part of our production database or production system? You tell me. This is the code review. You're, you're giving me feedback on, no, that sucks. You've got a bug here. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Critique my code. That's what a code review is. Yeah. Um, that function probably shouldn't be called get air distance. Okay. Because if you're just doing any spherical law of cosines, then you probably, I mean, it could be between two cities. Okay. It could be between two things. It shouldn't just apply to Earth and sky. And stuff. Okay. For so it it shouldn't just apply to latitudes and longitudes on Earth. It could apply to any ball, right? Uh, so you could, you, 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 uh, uh, that would be a very, if that, that's a little bit of Yagni uh, going a bit too far. I don't want to go that far though, right? No, 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 per perfectly fine because, uh, oh yeah, well, you know, uh, uh, and code reviews are, are go back and forth too. Like, uh, well, we, this is the only, uh, this is the only use case that we have for this is computing distances on, a, on the earth. So if we ever, you know, if we ever do extend functionality that I need a physics engine or something in this banking system, then, uh, then yeah, maybe, maybe we'll revisit that issue, right? Yeah. Um, I don't even know that that's possible in Java. Yeah, there's no pass by reference, right? There is passed by reference, reference, but not not that it's. Uh, if if I did this, then it would be passing by reference technically, but they're all immutable, so I don't have that problem. Awesome, that's good. Immutability is very good. Well, think about think about grading. If you were a grader next year in this course, what would you say? Yeah. Please, please God, please put documentation. Exactly, and what kind of documentation should we do? please start uh, adopting uh, doc style comments. It's not just Java. C++, C++ Python, or not Python, uh, PHP, a bunch of other languages have doc style comments. That's the slash star star, and then it nicely formats it for you in this, uh, uh, this, in this manner, right? And then you can put in uh, basic HTML stuff. You can put in internal links, right? You can say, see, oh, here, I, I have to do more documentation here. Uh, all right, there, there's some documentation. That's not the complete documentation, by the way. We're gonna have to write this stuff. Uh, but what I can do is uh, I can make references to other documentation, right? Uh, this is a collection of uh, uh, methods to compute distances, right? That's simple enough documentation, but what you, what you can do is you can go um, see, uh, and I can put in a link here to, uh, let's see, degrees to radians for example, right? And hopefully I did it right. Uh, okay, I'll need to do, I think it's like this. I forget my doc styling, but then, uh, ah, okay, well it was better the other way. There we go, see this, and when I hover on this, then for example, see also, I can click on that and I get the documentation for that. This is how all of Java is built, uh, this Java SDK, because you can hover over, I don't know, 
uh, not doubles, but if I had a, oh, well, here, <laughs> math. Tell me about math. Okay, there's the Java doc on it, right? And uh, who, who? Un, unascribed, but Joseph Darcy wrote it since Java one. So Joseph Darcy will live in, in, in annals of history forever, right? What about the documentation on pi? Right? The double value that is closer than any other to pi. The ratio of the circumference of a, circu a circle to its diameter, right? So everybody knows what pi is, but that's a nice little piece of documentation there. You can, uh, you, you can have, uh, for example, here, let's go ahead and document this. Computes the uh, air distance between two uh, location, la latitude, longitude locations on the Earth. Capital or not? I'm not sure. Capital? All right. Earth pride. <laughs> All right, on Earth, uh, using the spherical law of cosines. Because there are lots of ways of computing, even on a, a globe. There's a heavisine function. There's a, same, there's a mercator projection, right? That you can then use a Euclidean distance after the projection onto a mercator map, right? So there's lots of ways that you can do this. What the heck is spherical law of cosines? I'm going to Google that. I'm going to read all about it on Wikipedia. And to make it more convenient for you to do so in the future, I'm going to put in a link to that documentation. Spherical law of cosines. There we go. Now, when you somebody looks at my documentation, they see, oh, I'd like to learn some more about that. Click on it. And even, uh, even your IDE has a web, basic web browser. So there's the spherical law of cosines. Right? Authorship, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, as far as your assignments are concerned, uh, authorship uh, is no longer necessary. I mean, it'll, it'll auto-generate auto this thing right here. But auto, uh, authorship header documentation is no longer necessary. That's what the readme file in your project is for. Uh, now, in real life, you, you, every piece of code has some sort of a copyright stuck at the top along with authorship. We don't have to go that far. Uh, and but because in real life, they write that once and then write a script to go ahead and insert it so that if they ever have to update that, they just rerun the script. It's auto-generated documentation. Uh, that's not necessary for your projects. What is necessary for your projects is every class has to be documented. Every major method needs to be documented. Right? Now, what is a major method? A, me a, a major method would be like, Airport, this get air distance right here. This needs to be documented. And I'm just going to steal the documentation over here, at least the wording. And there. Computes the air distance between uh, the two, not uh, airports, airports, or not the two, uh, between uh, this uh, uh, airport and the given airport uh, on the earth. There we go. That's, that's, that's more descriptive documentation right there, okay? Uh, but now I'm not talking about latitudes and longitudes because I'm in an airport class. An airport is an airport. I don't have to worry about those details. Uh, that is a major method, right? Or non-trivial method. What about, get, what about getters? Do those need to be documented? No, that's just, that's just cruft. That's just uh, uh, busy work, right? Uh, what about the two-string method? Nah. In fact, do you inherit documentation? <laughs> if you put the override there, you inherit documentation. Right. Uh, what about a constructor? Uh, not really. I mean, unless it's something really special like that copy constructor, right? Uh, then you can say that it's a copy constructor. But the pattern itself tells you that this is a copy constructor. Why? Because it takes an airport. Right. Code should be self-documenting. You don't have to document this code because it is self-documenting. This, on the other hand, uh, get air distance. I wonder how that works. Oh, spherical law of cosines. It's not the Hevesine function. It's not the Mercator projection. It's the spherical law of cosines. That's good documentation. And then, of course, this documentation up here. It can be as simple as that. This class model is an airport, right? All right. Good. Anything else? What are your thoughts on that? What is that? 
Six three seven one. Yeah. What does it What does it represent? Do you remember the spherical law of cosines formula I gave you? Uh, radius of the Earth in what unit? Okay, you know that because you <laughs> because it's too small. But we don't like magic numbers, so double uh, Earth radius. In fact, we did this in the other one, right? Uh, in over here, yes, there. Does that belong there? No. Where does that belong? Over here, where it's probably used, right? Uh, remember what public means? Everybody can see it, but that's okay because it's final. Nobody can change it. It is static, meaning that it belongs to the class instead of every distance util instance having a, 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 a having a, a copy of this variable. Uh, and uh, the styling is that it's all uppercase with words separated by an underscore. That's that's the usual way of doing stuff, which looks really familiar. Pi. It is a public static final double. Right? In fact, we can hover over the documentation and see that. Well, we don't, we're not going to see the modifiers here. Uh, but certainly you can't change pi. Uh, and, uh, and it follows the same naming conventions. All uppercase, but pi is one word, so there's no... Uh, there's no second word to delimit with an underscore. All right. Let's go ahead and do uh, some documentation here, though. Uh, the radius of the Earth in okay Earth in kilometers. That's where the nice kilometers comes in because Earth radius, as long as everything else is consistently in the same uh, scale, uh, metric, then we don't have to worry about saying in KMS or km, uh, kilometers, right? But it is nice to put that into the documentation for somebody who may not know how big the Earth is. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, that looks good. And then did we use it down here? Oh, no, not yet. There. Reuse it down here. Now, because you're in this class, you don't need it, but uh, distance utils dot, that's the better way of accessing uh, static variables. All right, this looks good. If you really want to get into this, okay, then go ahead and do the Manhattan distance. Go ahead and do the uh, Euclidean distance, the Hevesine function, a bunch of different functions here. This is good enough for me for now. All right. Let's go back over to, uh, I'll, I'll keep this here even though I would not keep that in general. Uh, let's go back over here to airport and see what else we can do to clean this up. We've got some documentation here, good. Member variables, is that good documentation? No. Not in the final version. In my demonstration here, telling you that these are member variables, great. Uh, but that's not something that should remain in the final pro uh, product, right? Uh, you, you don't document self-documenting code. So if you've got FOPEN or sca new scanner of, from a file, you don't have documentation right above it that says open the file, right? Th that's self-explanatory. Uh, I think I documented everything that I want to document with, with respect to get air distance. Uh, this looks good. And then, of course, I'll leave this just uh, so that you have an example when this gets posted. Uh, what's, oh, well, but what's the problem? I got rid of that earth radius. Okay, fine. I'm going to have to restore it, bring it back, and then also I need to take care of all this stuff. So uh, remember that it I still have not converted from radians here. So copy, paste. All right, there. And then I'll go ahead and change these to the latitudes, 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 right? Uh, is there a better way? Uh, well, these I'm going to probably have to do. Right? This dot latitude. This dot longitude. That dot latitude. And that dot longitude. Okay. What are you complaining about? Oh. All right. Why is it? Why is it complaining? Well, it's private. I want to keep it private. Should I be taking my stuff, giving it to somebody else just to convert it to radians, uh, or what? Is there about how would you do? How would you go about doing this? I've got what do I have? I've got a degrees to radians. I've got gear, get air distance that takes. These are all uh, latitude of the origin in degrees. Right? Lat longitude of the origin. Of the origin uh, in, in degrees, 
and then these two things, but destination and longitude of the destination. So how could I just reuse this instead of doing all this stuff? No? Yeah. Get air distance. And what do I pass to it? This dot latitude, so I don't have to change it, right? Because it changes it for me. Uh, and I don't have to know anything about distances or earth radiuses or uh, radians and degrees. All I need to know is latitudes, longitudes. This dot longitude, that dot latitude, and that dot longitude. Oops. There we go. All right, and then I return it. Nice, simple. Code reuse, right? I don't have to, uh, uh, my first hint that I was doing something wrong was I copy pasted from another class. It was already done. Okay. Anything a little bit better? Another improvement. I did the, the I did the variable name that just to draw your attention to the fact that there are two objects, this object and that object. I'm in the class, so I'm referring to this object, me. There, I'm also given this class that's oh, this instance that's outside the class that I refer to as that. Right? I just wanted to, uh, when I did this initially, I wanted to draw your attention to that fact. But is that a good variable name? That what? <laughs> it. <laughs> or x. Right? Not a good variable name. What would be a better, better variable name here? Destination. Oh, okay. Destination. I like that. Right? Otherwise, airport. That's okay. A. Uh, okay. I like destination. Except that, wait, now I've got to change that one and that one. And by the way, now my documentation is out of sync. I've got to change that one. Okay. So I'm resigned to copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, make mistakes somewhere, go, have to go back, fix it, spend five minutes on uh, doing this and debugging it later on. But, mm, okay. Right click, refactor, rename to destination. So you see what happened? Every instance of that variable was automatically changed. In fact, because I was using proper Java docs here, it also saw the connection between the variable and this markup right here, and it changed it automatically for me. Done. Right. You can do that with any variable, any class name. If you've got a class name that you want uh, misspelled and you need to rename it, rename or refactor, rename. And if there's a reference to it in 50 other classes, it'll change them all automatically. Right. Cool. Whoa. Not cool. Oh, definitely not cool. There we go. All right. All right, good. I think that this is a, a, now of course I need to go back and take care of address and date built, whatever. Right? Uh, one thing one thing that, uh, now they didn't report it for this section, but one thing that the LAs did notice is that some people were having trouble with chaining. Uh, what I mean by that is, let's go down here to two string. Uh, well, let, let's go to the demo um, and get rid of this stuff. Oh, by the way, does main need to be a, a Documented? No, that's one of those trivial functions. Uh, so I don't have an address example here, do I? No, I don't. Okay, full, fine. Address A is equal to new address 123A Street, Omaha, Nebraska, 68116. That's, that's not an Omaha zip, but whatever. Uh, and let's go up here and Let's give that address to this Omaha right here. Now this is not gonna work because I don't have a constructor over here that takes an address, just one that takes name, GPS ID, uh, latitude and longitude. So what do I do? Can't see it, but source, generate constructors using fields, done and good. Now the, the auto-generated one here is kind of bad uh, because this this one is actually more general than this one right here. So what I would want to do is I would want to change it. Did we do this, the this keyword on functions? All right, the, 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 this is good. 
All right, let me back up here. What do you immediately see from this? Duplication, all right? How do I reduce this duplication? I could have one function call another function. And in this case, I've got two constructors. I have one constructor call the other constructor. Which way should we go? Which one is more general? Which one's the most general? Bottom one, the one that takes five arguments. So we should have the more specific one call the more general one. How do I call that function? Because it does all the same stuff and more, right? Oh, date built. Uh, I didn't mean to do that. We'll get rid of that for now. There we go. How do I have this constructor call another constructor? So I do airport name, GPS ID, latitude, longitude. And because I'm not passing in an address, I'll just say null. It's not going to let me do that. How do I refer to a constructor? How did I refer to the object? Uh, this. So how do you, I, you think I refer to a constructor of the object? Also this. Right. Looks kind of weird, but that's because constructors are special. Right? They're not regular methods. There. I really only have one constructor now, and that other constructor calls these this constructor. Right. Awesome. Code duplication is now reduced. Okay. Now let's go back to the and finish up this demonstration. Uh, let's run this and make sure that it works. All right. It is 88 kilometers from Lincoln to Omaha by air. Sound reasonable? Yeah, I think it's a. I, I don't think that these are the correct uh, coordinates, but uh, it's within the realm of possibility here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let's see. Here, here's Omaha. I want to print out Omaha's address. So I could go system.out.println. Well, I could print out Omaha, and that's what this stuff is doing down here. Let me get rid of this so that we can see what's going on here. It's printing out Omaha. That's the object, because that's what I did in the toString method. What if I want to print out Omaha's address? Uh, I don't have a getter. Darn it. All right, type, 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 or, well, in this case, I'm going to type because it's quicker. Public address, get address, return this dot. I can type faster than I can click uh, generate can getter. All right. All right. There. 123A Street, Omaha, Nebraska, 68901, or 68116. What if I just want to print out the city? Get city. Follow that. Call these links. I've got Omaha, which is an airport object. I call a method on that airport object to get a different object, a an address object. That address object has methods, including getters to get the city. So get the city of that. It returns a string now. And in fact, I can go even further, dot to uppercase. And now Omaha will be all uppercase instead. That's called chaining. You got, why? Because you've got, a, uh, you've got a link, another link, another link, another link, as many times as you want uh, until you get down to the end. And uh, I was surprised that the, uh, the, some people in the other section were having trouble with this because this is exactly what you do in C, right? How did you do it in C? You've got a structure that owns another structure that owns another structure. So structure dot field name dot field name dot field name. It's just simple uh, chaining is what it's called. Right. Also, these kind of look like links. So maybe that's another. No, probably not. All right. All right. Any questions so far? No. So we've we've effectively demonstrated the first two pillars of object-oriented programming. Which, uh, if I go back to it here, uh, oh, I never had the pillars here. All right. So. Uh, one of the pillars is, uh, is encapsulation. The other is abstraction, which I didn't define immediately right away, but that's what we're going to look at now. Okay, uh, the, we're going to look at the pillars and the and I start usually off with a uh, overview uh, of the of the history. Right, so the history, history of OOP. Right? And I don't like to get big into this because well, it's not a history class. If you want to. Uh, want to know the, the history of a programming languages, 
There are, there are plenty of articles out there. There's uh, uh, these nice taxonomies or these nice lineages of programming languages. You've probably seen them before. You could probably, we could probably pull up one of them, a uh, big giant map of programming language lineage or family tree or whatever it might be. Uh, let's, look, let's look at images. Uh, hopefully this is safe. Uh, no, okay. Anyway, I've, I've seen them before, I've, I've, I've posted them, but basically that, uh, look at one lineage. We'll start with C. What's a, what's a predecessor to C? Oh, no, so, uh, that's a successor. What's the, what came before C? Uh, okay, the, but the language that came before C. If, if C++ comes after C, then what comes before C? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's the joke, it is, it's BPCL or BCPL, I forget what it is. And that's why he called it C, or uh, Kernighan and Ritchie called it C, because they weren't that creative. They, they've been working in B. All right, well, what's next? C. All right? Not necessarily that they had a close connection, but that's just because that's what they named it. Then what came after C? Y++. It's an iterator, right? I, uh, I, uh, for int I, uh, I++, plus plus, et cetera, right? They just go on to the next one, right? Uh, so it's that kind of history that I'm not that interested in. Uh, but what I am interested in is why that history formed. So you said assembly, right? And that came before even, uh, you know, procedural style programming. What came even before that? Punch cards, binary. So at the dawn of the computing age, you had to sit there and you had to not only think like a machine, but you had to talk like a machine. You punch the card 010101. Uh, basically, you had to be the compiler. You, you might have thought about your program in a high level, then translated that to the machine code somehow in some, you know, on a big giant whiteboard and hope that you, you get all the punch cards exactly right <laughs> and, and that you've got a million punch cards and that you don't drop them and now they're unsorted, right? Uh, that's, that's a program crash, right? So very early day, you're, you were forced to think like a computer. Then what comes along? Assembly. So that you don't have to talk like a computer anymore. You can write code that looks like take the value in register A and put it in and add it to the value stored in register B and store the result in register C. If the result in register C is greater than zero, jump to memory location X. Right? That's a basic if condition. Uh, but it still forces you to think like a machine because you're thinking in terms of hardware, in terms of a bunch of metal. Right? Then what comes after assembly? higher level procedural style programming languages, like C, where you don't have, you're not tied to any particular hardware. If this hardware only has three registers versus that hardware that has 32 registers, you don't have to speak in those terms anymore. It's a little bit more abstract, right? Now you can say printf, if conditions, uh, loops, etc. cetera, right? Well, that's still not quite to where we are as humans up here, right? Uh, so what comes next? In fact, What's the ideal up here? Human programming, how do, uh, natural language, right? Star Trek, you, you, you tell your computer exactly what you want and the computer uh, interprets it for you and does exactly what you want. Now we have Alexa, we have natural language processing. That's still light years away from Star Trek level stuff, right? Because Alexa, I mean, first of all, my Alexa doesn't even work, it's a piece of garbage, but uh, uh, it, it never understands what you say it certainly would not be able to uh, understand your actual meaning because natural language is all metaphor. It's idioms, right? Uh, and it's very, very difficult to, uh, to do that. It, it can't detect sarcasm, right? Uh, like, shut, shut up. Yeah, that's great, Alexa. Oh, you're welcome, right? right. But that, that's the ideal. So we're still not there yet, but at least we're above C now. Above C, what do we have? Object-oriented programming, at least in my view, that's what that is. We do not have to think in terms of machine, uh, machines anymore, in terms of uh, a bunch of ASCII characters. We don't have to think in terms of numbers. We don't have to think in terms of, uh, you know, low-level details like you do in C, where do I have enough memory to do this concatenation? If not, I need to do a bunch of other stuff. Right? I can talk directly about this string and that string, and I can add them together. Right? I don't have to worry about those low-level details anymore. Uh, that's object oriented. I can talk, start talking about real world objects. I've got a banking system. You've got a banking system project. Uh, what, what's in a banking system? Well, uh, accounts, owners, 
uh, and so I don't have to speak in terms of a, a collection of numbers over here. I've got an actual bank account or object over here. I've got an actual person object over here, and I can relate them somehow. It allows you to think about real world objects, and you're getting ever closer to that natural language processing. That, at least that's my view. Right? If you really want to know, uh, there are uh, many OOP languages for uh, wedges, right? So uh, way back in the day, of course, there you could say that uh, what small talk, uh, not algal. Uh, what is it? What's the very first? I don't know. Let's ask Google. Google, what do you think is the fir the first OOP language? Who gets credit for that? Uh, Alan K. It's Alan K. What did he write? It was was it small talk? No, oh, small talk. Uh, come on, what? Not lists. Yeah, okay, small talk. All right, they get credit. Alan K gets credit for small talk. Uh, small talk. Uh, there was another one though, even before that, that had the concept of atoms, which were essentially cl uh, essentially classes or something like that. Uh, but then you had the real first generation of popular object-oriented programming languages, like C++. And by the way, C++, the original, was actually just written in C. Uh, it was just a bunch of you know, macros that you could have classes. The first name was C with classes. And uh, it's not that snappy, so what's next? Oh, C++, haha, <laughs> clever. Right? Uh, what other object uh, the, the, of, of the same era? Objective-C. And you can see where the name get, comes from that. C with objects, right? Objective C. Does anybody know what it's used for? Or what it was used for? Uh, iOS programming, right? And you can see on the Toybee index, you know, the adoption of uh, Swift, its predecessor, and the uh, declination of uh, Objective C. And uh, Objective C is essentially dead. If you're going to do iOS programming, do it in Swift now. Right? Don't learn Objective C. That's why they made Swift, because nobody was wanting to do Objective-C anymore. Right? Uh, then you have like kind of the next generation, which was 10, 15 years after. You have Java. And what's the other Java of the same era? C-sharp. Oops, there we go. C-sharp. Why'd they call it sharp, by the way? Yet another. So, so clever. You play an instrument? All right, so A, B, C. And what's next? Exactly. <laughs> that's where they get it. C sharp. Right. Uh, that's why it's a hash. Uh, hash too. Uh, that's the sharp symbol on music notes, or whatever. Uh, so and yet, uh, oh, so clever. Uh, but uh, many other non OOP languages have adopted OOP aspects. For example, uh, Python, PHP, JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript actually was OOP from the beginning. It was just a different type of OOP. Uh, it was called prototype, prototypical OOP, where you don't have, you didn't have classes to begin with in JavaScript. You had prototypes instead. But now you have, in the latest versions of JavaScript, you do have classes. Uh, it's just syntactic sugar. Uh, it, it does it in exactly the same way. Uh, Python, I think it started out with classes. Am I correct? Anybody know the history of Python? But Python's lineages are, go back to non-object-oriented programming languages, or more functional style programming languages. That's why when you do something, uh, if you're coming from an OOP background and you do something in Python, then you kind of get criticized for doing it. That's not the Pythonic way of doing it. Right? Have you ever heard that term before? The Pythonic way? The Pythonic way is the old school functional style stuff. Uh, so you get yelled at if, uh, if, you, if you do it wrong. But. Uh, I don't care because as long as it runs, as long as it solves a problem, that's my concern. Right? As, and of course that it's maintainable. PHP is another example where it didn't start out with classes or really any OOP stuff at all it's because it was some Ras uh, Rasmus Lerdorf in his basement uh, uh, hacking away at it. Later on, I think in version 5, classes were added. Uh, maybe 4, I forget. Uh, but you can see that a lot of object-oriented programming languages either started out that way or they became more object-oriented by adopting language features of object-oriented programming. Uh, some, of the, uh, if some of the benefits is that it facilitates, facilitates real-world entities and modeling. Uh, 
it models them uh, because you can create a class to represent an airport rather than uh, a, a, a now it's kind of a, you can do the same thing in C, which is not an object-oriented programming language at all. You can do a, a structure, but that, that that only does the first part of encapsulation, the grouping of data. It doesn't provide any protection of that data. It doesn't pro provide any of the grouping of functionality that add, uh, that acts on that data. Right? Uh, so th that's why it kind of falls short. Uh, there's a clear demarcation of responsibility. Right. And functionality. Distance, you, distance, a, a distance class is responsible for distance stuff. Uh, an airport class is responsible for airport stuff. And don't go mixing your chocolate and your peanut butter together. Right? Unless it's Reese's peanut butter cup or Reese's pieces, those are fine, just fine too. Or the Reese's peanut butter cups with the Reese's pieces inside. Right. Yeah, <laughs> nasty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's not fight about awesome candies. All right. They're all good. Uh, also, modularity and decomposition. <laughs> right? So it supports all these things. Right? All right. So what are objects? Because object-oriented programming, there are, there are actually four pillars, but sometimes people call them five. That's because you've got a room. There are four pillars. Uh, not to knock on our uh, chancellor, but uh, the, uh, he started out with like uh, the N150 vision with four pillars. And then uh, as an afterthought, I think, that, oh, wait, we left out computing. We have five pillars. <laughs> so like, has anybody ever seen a five pillar building? Uh, I haven't. But uh, I'm glad that uh, computing is part of that pillarship now or whatever you want to call them. Uh, but uh, there, there are usually four pillars. That's abstraction, encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. Sometimes people tack on a fifth pillar being objects because, of course, it's in the name, right? Uh, so what are objects uh, formally? Formally, an object is a general entity characterized by identity, state, and behavior. This sounds almost like encapsulation, at least state and behavior does. Identity is simply an aspect that allows one instance of an object to be distinguishable from another instance of an object. Right. Now, from a, pers from a practical point of view, that simply means that these are two things stored in different memory locations. This is why you can't use equals equals to compare strings. Because if you've got a string hello, and another string, hello, stored in different memory locations. Those are two distinct I objects. They have identity right? uh, because of their memory addresses. Now, maybe you mean something else by identity. Maybe you mean, does this string contain the same content as this string? In which case, you use equals. And that's your identity. That's your I identity identity, I guess. Right? Uh, and you just need some way to distinguish instances of objects. Right? The state is simply the a collection of properties or elements, uh, attributes, data, fields, or in the context of Java, we call them member variables, right? Uh, that define the object. Right? So that's pretty straightforward. An airport has uh, state uh, four th or five things, right? An address, which is another object, a name, GPS ID, latitude, longitude. Behavior is a collection of functionality uh, describes what an object does or how you can interact with it. Right? Right? That's the uh, methods, uh, functions, etc. That all belong to a class. Right? The way that object-oriented programming works is a little bit different. Now, from your perspective, if you call math.square root, that's no different than calling the square root function in, in C. Right? You're still invoking a function. Technically, though, what happens, it's all opaque because the, that, that's what it looks like. Technically, what happens is what's called message sending. So communication between objects is achieved through message sending. Right. Uh, you can invoke a member method in another object uh, without 
having to worry about the dispatch details. It's going to come. It's not too apparent on the subtle difference yet until we start talking about inheritance. Eventually, when we talk about inheritance, we're going to have a superclass, and then we're going to have subclasses that can inherit behavior. So if I've got a function, function foo up here, I can override that function down here to do something slightly different. Right? And then I can override the uh, function foo over here to do something yet slightly different. So I have three foo functions in my code space. The, all I do though is if I've got an object, is it, is it the super object, is it the super class, is it this class over here, or is it this class over here? I don't know, I don't care. I just send it a message. Call your foo method. And it is responsible for determining what am I because it has identity. What function did you actually mean to call? Oh, my function, this function, right? And not to be confused with the, the keyword this. So it is a little bit different than simply just invoking a function. And the way that that's realized usually is through a virtual table or a V table. Again, we'll revisit that later on when we're actually talking about inheritance. Uh, a, uh, uh, the publicly, publicly available, uh, the public methods of an object is its interface. Now I'm putting that in double quotes here because there is a keyword interface uh, in Java that has a slightly different meaning, so I don't want you to get confused with that. Uh, an interface is just simply that here's an object. How do I know what I can do with it, right? How do I know that it's, its behavior? There might be some internal working, some private methods that it calls and, 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 and uh, like, like the example over here, did we make that private? Yeah, we made that private, even though it's a static method. We can't see it, but it's still useful to the class. From the perspective outside of this class though, all I can see is get error distance and, uh, uh, and, and the Earth's radius here. Right? So only the uh, public methods are its interface. Um, objects are constructed instead of just assigned. Right? And how do we construct objects in Java? Or well, in many programming languages, uh, OOP languages. To, yep. The new keyword, Java uses uh, the new keyword to invoke a constructor method. And in Java, like you saw yesterday in lab, uh, and, and last week, or yeah, last week in, in demonstration, uh, default no argument constructor is provided for you automatically. Uh, if you define your own constructor, it goes away. You can always explicitly redefine it later. You can have as many constructors as you want. You can have special copy constructors, et cetera, et cetera. Right? There's more than one way to construct an object as long as you, you know, implement those ways. Okay. Uh, a general approach, approach to designing objects is just simply semantics dictate design. Right. So remember the, uh, the, now we've got an airport here. How, do you remember the process by which we said, how do we design an airport object? We started asking questions about, well, what is an airport? I asked you questions about, about airports. And what was the first answer? No? I thought that there was an answer. What was the first answer? Name, right? Okay, so we need a name. What, what is a name? Oh, it's a string. Okay, we're done with that part. What else is a, an airport? A latitude and longitude? Okay, are those integers? No, they're doubles. Okay, that gave us this design, right? Semantics dictate design. Semantics are meaning. So if I say, what is an airport? All you have to do is define an airport in the real world and that dictates your design in code. Right? Now maybe some, some things you don't need and so you can go back and take those out. Uh, you can go overboard, remember, Yagni? You ain't gonna need it. Uh, don't over-design your objects. Don't, okay, well a person has a name. A name is a first name, last name, middle name, optional second middle name, uh, maiden name, uh, preferred name, uh, title, suffix, uh, right? Uh, Esquire, junior, or whatever, right? Uh, all these things, right? That's overdoing it, right? Quit while you're ahead. Just have first name, last name. Don't need an object for that, okay? So don't over-engineer, right? Again, Yagni. 
But uh, it's kind of like how you do uh, top-down design. Right? Top-down design, you ask yourself, okay, I need to solve this problem. So I need to open the file, I need to do this, I need to do that, I need to do that. Okay, well, this one subtask, I can break that into three smaller tasks. You break it into smaller and smaller tasks until, when do you stop? A single line of code and you just implement it directly or a solution already exists. So break down an object into parts until uh, it is so simple that you can directly implement it or a solution all, or, or a class already exists. Again, the prime example of this is an airport has a date built. Okay, well, if I'm overzealous, I might say, I need a date object now because I need a year, day, and month. Stop short there. There's already built into Java a local date, method, uh, local date object. There's no address object, so okay, it's not going overboard to go ahead and design and implement that. That's what we had to do there. But it's so simple that you either uh, directly implement it, address, right? Or it is a class already exists like local date. Okay, and that's how you design objects, right? Generally, rely on composition to relate objects to each other, objects to each other, right? Uh, a, an airport owns an address, an instance of an address, right? Uh, a person might have an address or a local date or something like that. That's composition, that one object is composed of another object. Right? Okay. And finally, on your design is avoid the god anti-pattern. So first of all, what's a pattern? A pattern is a reusable uh, pattern. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry to define uh, something in, in terms of itself, but uh, a pattern is just simply, you know, like a pattern. You see, uh, they're creational patterns. Uh, there, the, for example, uh, there are builder patterns where you can build an object iteratively uh, if, you, if you follow this pattern. The chaining pattern, that's called a fluent pattern. Or it's not exactly. It's hard to describe without getting into it, and I don't want to get into it. Uh, you know what? Here, I'll show you instead. String builder. SB is equal to new string builder. And then sb.append, hello, and then do this over and over and over again, hello world with a space, there we go, sb. Dot, sb, dot, sb dot. or what you can do is you can chain these. And the reason that you're able to chain these is that it's a pattern, this pattern is called the fluent design pattern. What happens is that append is not a void function. Append returns this. So that when you get it back, I, I want to append this, and then I also want this back so that I can go dot again, dot, 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 dot. Right? That's a fluent, uh, that's a fluent design pattern. Uh, and if you design your objects like this, then you, can, then you facilitate this kind of code usage where you don't have to go sb dot, sb dot, sb dot. Right? You can just go dot, 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 dot. Right? Nice. Uh, that's one design pattern. Let me go ahead and get rid of this. Uh, other design patterns are like creational patterns, uh, dispatch patterns, a bunch, bunch of other things. I'm, uh, that, uh, there's a whole book on it called Design Patterns. Right? What is an ant? Uh, and, uh, patterns generally are good habits to use or good things to reuse. What is an anti-pattern? If a pattern is a good habit, what is an anti-pattern? A bad habit. Bad habits to get into. One of those bad habits that you get into is the god anti-pattern, where your class design becomes all-knowing, all-seeing, all-doing, right? omniscient, omnipresent, om, uh, omni-everything, right? Uh, the, why? Because that's what a god is, right? God can do, uh, do everything, sees everything, is everything, right? And you don't want that. Just like in C or in just procedural Java, if you've got a if you've got a method that is like a thousand lines of code, is that good? No. no. What do you do? 
Take this chunk, move it out into its own method. Take that chunk, move it out into its own method. Right, you've got two identical pieces of code here. Move them out into their own method, two method calls now. Right? You separate things out so that you don't have a, a God function where it does everything. Likewise, with uh, uh, class designs, you want to make sure that your class is not everything. An address is not a distance. A distance is not an address. An address is not a person. An address is not a date. These are distinct things. Separate your responsibilities. Uh, and that's the S, the single responsibility principle. Okay. Avoid the God anti-pattern when you're uh, developing these stuff, th these things. Right? And there are plenty of other anti-patterns too. Uh, sometimes they're referred to as, as smells or uh, you know code smells. Uh, yeah, you know it, it, maybe it's okay to eat it, but it smells kind of funny, so maybe you don't want to eat it. All right, maybe it's rotten. Uh, maybe it's rotten. It's not necessarily that it is rotten, but uh, the, the anti-patterns are a smell. Right? Uh, but that there's something uh, fundamentally wrong with the code. So again, these are the other, these are the four pillars, abstraction and encapsulation. We've kind of covered these, but I want to rehash them a little bit. Uh, then late, uh, late, next week, we'll get on to inheritance and polymorphism. Uh, but just to review here, encapsulation is what? Those three things. The grouping of data, the protection of data, the grouping of functionality that acts on that data. Right? Uh, it's also, uh, it, it also might be nice to, to talk about what is the anti-pattern of encapsulation. So breaking the encapsulation. Don't create a needless a note. Don't uh, create mutable, that is changeable, uh, public uh, variables unless there is a very good reason to do so. Right? VGR, right? right? VGR, yeah. Make everything private. Make everything immutable unless you have a reason that, no, I, I don't want to make this immutable because I need to change it. And even then, you can look at other patterns. For example, when we looked at airport here, I said, uh, I want a way to create an airport, but I want a way to change its name. So I created a copy constructor here, where it took everything, uh, everything from the old airport, but then all, except for the name, and it took a different name and, and, and made a different name. So there are patterns that you can follow so that you, you can always keep your uh, variables private. You can always keep them immutable. Right? Uh, don't. Don't locate code that involves a class's object outside the class. Right? If I have to hand this object over to another class and then that object rips it open to, to get the internals, calls a bunch of getters, then you probably located it in a, the wrong class. Bring it back over here into this class. Right? Uh, that's breaking encapsulation. Uh, the other one would be... Uh, not don't not use classes <laughs> so sorry for that phrasing there let's let's just say use use classes right you can't avoid that right but let's think about homework one homework one uh if you were to do, think about doing it in java because a lot of uh, most people in here did it in php uh the third part uh the game report what's the first thing that you would want to do if you're doing that in java Make a game class, make a game object, so that you can parse the file. You now have a collection of game objects, so that you can reason about games instead of a bunch of two-dimensional string arrays, right? Or a bunch of a bunch of meaningless strings. Now you have meaning to it. This is a game, and this is its publisher. This is its title, right? I can th think in terms of games instead of thinking in terms of string one, string two, string three, right? Uh, so use classes, right? The, that's basically the anti three, four, uh, two, and one. Right? Uh, the grouping of data. If you're not grouping data, you're not using classes. Now you're in C without even structures. Okay. All right. So don't break encapsulation. Uh, finally, what's abstraction? So tell me from 155. How did we, what did we talk about in, in 155 with respect to abstraction? Ca talked about procedural abstraction. This will sound familiar. Abstraction. There we go. So instead of defining it immediately, I'm going to ask you the same question I ask all the time. How does uh, math.square root work? I don't know either. 
This is a good question. How would you go about finding this answer? Ah, that square root. There it is. There's the documentation. Default implementation, strict math. All right, follow that. Uh, and now it's a native. Uh, so, no, okay, that's the end of the road. We do not know why. It's whatever C library is actually doing it for us. <laughs> this is a, a, a native function call, meaning that it's calling whatever was compiled with your Java virtual machine. Uh, it was probably written in C. Right? So that's the end of the line. I don't know. There's no way that I can answer that without jumping into that other code. But what's the real answer? Yeah, who cares? Now, there are some answers that you can give, like it might be the Babylonian method, interpolation method, right? the EDSAC method, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you can get an entire book on numerical analysis and find at least two dozen numerical methods for convergence on computing the square root, right? Actually, a Taylor series, right? You could do a Taylor series. You could do uh, a different Taylor series, right? What's the, what's the real answer here is who cares? Why don't you care? I don't, I need to compute the square root to solve this other problem over here. Procedural abstraction means that I can call a function, a function's uh, details are hidden from us. All I do, I give it input, it gives me output, right? I don't have to care about it, it's a black box. All I care about is getting my answer. Now, in terms of object-oriented programming, what is OOP, uh, abstraction in OOP? Again, I'm going to ask you another, a similar question. How does local date work or represent a date? Right. What's the real answer? OK. Jump into it. Implements, blah, blah, blah. These are all static methods. Oh, there's our answer. What is it? Three integers. Short is an integer. It's just a 16-bit uh, integer. Uh, so three numbers. Three numbers. Three integers. That's the, that's, that's the real answer. <laughs> uh, is there another way of representing time? ISO... 8601 strings, right. for example, I'm not going to have an example. Let me open up a web browser here and get an example, Wikipedia. ISO is an international standard, 8601, it's, it's number, it's, it looks like this. Right. That looks like, oh no, that's the sixth, and that's tonight, so, oh, uh, that's Greenwich Mean Time though, so that could be right now, right? There's an ISO 8601 formatted string. Uh, that is year, month, day, T for time. That's the delimiter. It's on a 24-hour scale. Uh, and then the Greenwich mean offset. And it looks like this one is accurate only to seconds. You can get accurate to, I think, hundreds of millisec or milliseconds or microseconds or something like that. What's another way that you can represent a string or uh, a date? No? Never heard of Unix time? All right. So uh, it is the number of seconds, so a single number, one number, right? Uh, the number of seconds since the Unix epoch, which is January 1st, 1970. So you could use a single number, a single number, right? This is the Unix time epoch. And the problem there, of course, is that in 2038, we're going to run out. Uh, if you're using a 32-bit a signed integer, we're going to run out of seconds. Uh, and so it'll become like 1902 again uh, in 2038. That's OK. Just upgrade so that you're using a 64-bit number, and now you're several billion years out into the future. Right? In fact, how many billions of years are you, are you out in the future? Uh, well, from alpha uh, 1970 plus. Uh, 2 to the 63rd, because there's one bit for the sign, uh, seconds. Okay, 
whatever that number is, average Gregorian years, <laughs> seconds to years. So 1970 plus 2.9 to or 292 billion years. So we're we're good if you're as long as you're using a 64-bit number. Right? Okay. Again, what's the real answer that you want to give? Who cares? Right? You just want to use it. And just like I did over here, right? Uh, how do you end up using this local date? Well, you can, uh, I think, uh, oh, I guess I uh, commented it out, right? But this is how you might use it. Uh, local date, uh, this dot date built is equal to local date dot of, and then this is the year 19, oh, 2020. Today is, uh, is what, the sixth? There. And then you can do all sorts of stuff like date built, uh, local date uh, tomorrow is equal to uh, date or local date dot now. Plus, now, uh, now, ideally, what I would want to do is I would want to add one day or days dot one, right? Or something like that. I can go with dot add oh no dot what is it plus there we go and then i have to do uh years to add no days to add there we go one and there i get the concept of tomorrow i just need to know how to use the object i don't need to know that there are three numbers and then maybe it increments day and then it does some you know some complicated logic to, that says 30 days has September, April, June, and November, or whatever it is. Uh, oh, by the way, this is a leap year, so we need to add one more for this month, right? All that complicated logic is all encapsulated. Whoa, there's, maybe there's the logic, yeah. Fancy, fancy logic. Epoch, it's using an epoch day, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All this fancy logic is in the class, and I never have to worry about it because I use the publicly available interface, right? The real answer is who cares? Details, uh, abstraction, abstraction in OOP means you do not, you do not have to worry about implementation or representation details. Right? It's all encapsulated in the class. Now, I'm using encapsulation in the context of abstraction. They're kind of the MC Escher drawing, hand drawings where they're, they're yin and yang of each other. They're, they, they're kind of they can't be separated. One one hand draws the other. Abstraction supports encapsulation. Encapsulation supports abstraction, right? uh, because you're protecting data and you're grouping the the functionality that acts on that data. So they they go hand in hand, which is why I cover them in parallel with each other implicitly. All right. Uh, another example: the string class. And this is, what, this is one of the motivations I was mentioning for object-oriented programming. In C, how would you have to deal with strings? I want to, here's hello and world. I want to concatenate them together. What do you have to do? Strcat, -cat. and I have to give it these two strings, right? But then before I even do that, what do I have to do? I have to make sure, memory management, I have to make sure that this thing that I'm concatenating on has enough room. If not, then create a new string you know, then uh, str copy, str cat, and by the way, at the end of the day, what do I have to do? Make sure at the end that it's all okay? A null terminating character. All those details are my responsibility because it's not encapsulated into a class that takes care of it for me, right? That's one of the beauties of uh, object-oriented programming. You can encapsulate stuff and not have to worry about those details every single time you do it. And it is, you can do that somewhat in C if you have a my awesome concatenation function that takes care of everything for you, right? You can have a function like that that returns a brand new string, but it's still just a function. Right? There's no objects here at all. It still returns an array that's null terminated that you still have to do memory management on, bookkeeping on, and ensure that it always going, is going to remain null terminated. Right? All those details are maintained inside the class in object-oriented programming. Right? By the way, uh, how the, the question here is how does Java represent a string? And of course the real answer is who cares? But you can always find that out. Checking your local library. Right? Literally checking your local library. All right, that one fell on. <laughs> ah, come on. <laughs> that one fell on deaf ears. 
this is this is your local library right here. Right? And so how does it how does it actually? Uh, okay, there's a coder. There we go. What's it doing? There is a a byte array. It's not null terminated because uh, you don't need that here. Uh, but a byte array, and then that's why it's immutable. It creates that array. It does not dynamically increase or decrease. Uh, well, that's one of the reasons it's immutable, uh, is because it, it creates it and stores it and does not change it. Right? It, it. So it doesn't have to do memory management. A whole bunch of other things, blah, 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 blah. Right? There's your answer. Check your local library. Come on. <laughs> that was a great joke. All right. Any questions so far? No? All right. Then uh, what I'll do is I'll leave this here. Uh, since we've already talked about it at length, uh, a, a, a rehash of encapsulation, that it's the grouping of data, protection of data, grouping of, uh, vis of uh, methods that act on that data. You can do that with visibility keywords, public, protected, don't worry about that yet, private. Uh, and I think I already covered all these, but basically you, you prefer immutable objects, make everything private unless there is an overwhelmingly good reason not to do so. Then when we come back on Tuesday, we'll start talking about inheritance, which is kind of code reuse on steroids, right? That you can uh, create a class and subclass it and then re-inherit everything automatically, not have to reinvent the wheel. <laughs>